Well, that, that was, again, you see, at the very end of that was another one of Peter's, the, the, the cardboard animation. Cardboard animation, which we had left over, which he had left over, and that was very important. I think that's the story about lives, really, our careers, is that one thing got left over and used for something next, and they, one thing led to the other. But this, these stories, the saga of Nogan and the Nog, that very, very crude drawing there, which I'm a bit ashamed of, because it was so, you know, I hadn't really drawn for animation, except for the Eye of the Engines ones, and it was drawing on a piece of uh, thick wallpaper and these cutouts. But, um, yes, they worked. Just it was still a, it was still a still set of still pictures, and the beginning of that was just the still pictures being told with added animation in the minimal animation. I keep on about this because it is my profession, is what you might call minimal animation. And we managed to keep that, the minima, minimalist going on right throughout. But as you were saying, what the main trouble was, was the fact that we were working at a distance. And uh, we couldn't, uh, I was going all over the place trying to get the bits and pieces. And Noggin appears several times in the film over the six episodes, which took me several months to make. And he's slightly different character each time. It was as if he had sort of stand-ins and uh, understudies coming on. And um, we had to do something about this. And immediately the problem arose because I got an order for 13 more I Will the Engines from Associated Rediffusion. And um, I had to do something about it. And uh, the, we obviously had to be nearer each other. And Peter, in any case, wanted to move to the country. And Peter moved into Kent and uh, where he bought a small farm, and uh, which hadn't had, had many animals in it, just about enough. And one I old, came... One old chicken and uh, a cat was left on That's right. Thing. And um, uh, I moved down there as well. Let's see one of the pictures of our massive, massive film studio. Now, somewhere in there, that's Peter's house. The film studio is in, at the moment, in the, uh, on the right, uh, on the right-hand side, the sort of dark lump, which was the cow shed. It was a cow shed, which yeah. we, we knocked a hole in the wall. Knocked a hole in the wall to make a window. Yeah. And that was where you worked. And I worked this end of it. And yeah. shall we see the next one? Uh, that's Peter in his cow shed, looking, looking really um, much like uh, 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 <laughs> an inhabitant of a cow shed. And uh, <laughs> then uh, so let's see the next one. And that's my studio. What a good looking young man he was. Yes. <laughs> that was four pig styes at one time, and raised to accommodate a slightly larger pig. And uh, it was very useful to have more room to work for a little while. But quite shortly afterwards, it, the room, we'll have the next picture. Uh, quite shortly afterwards, we ran out of room. We had that wasn't the next picture, but we'll do fine. Um, and uh, Peter had uh, organization. This is, this is organizing my drawing to try to make sure that I had heads and bodies for every uh, event. And uh, so we had these printed in several sizes. Very high tech in those days. We actually went to, to the photographers and got them blown up in, in different sizes so that I could cut them out and then. Oliver had his enormous tin of bits and pieces, and he would select the right head, the right body, and uh, it made life a lot smoother for you. Oh yes, because he was consistent, and I could go to go to you, and you would just uh, cut one of them out of the big, the big sheet. Yes, which is which is good, and um, but still black and white, you know. Oh, yeah, very much color, right. Yes, and color. Yeah, and um, the, then. Uh, we, we went on, it was still, uh, it was still being a, uh, take that one away for a moment, there we go, and we're having uh, space to work, that's right, it's a bit about having space to work, uh, which was until it got filled up with junk, and that was another picture, uh, which is uh, my yeah, studio, uh, <laughs> which is a sawn up tape recorder, which I was using as, a, as, a, um, as an editing machine, a broken camera, and a broken, all sorts of junk. And, um, but it was, um, it was all right to work in, um, although, I knew, although it was all there and in a terrible mess, I knew where everything was in the mess, thank goodness, and uh, was able to work that. That old projector there on the left there, that's your little projector, it would be so exciting for us as a family because when he got, um, yeah, tell him about it. Yeah, and then, then, but there I was able to make a new animation table, which uh, was the next picture, if you will. Uh, which is a slightly more complicated than the ostrich, and uh, I had um, uh, a camera in the middle of that, and uh, the, la the lights and things, and I sat at this, this side of it here. And can we see the next one, please? And uh, there's all the tins of heads and bodies and things <laughs> surrounding myself. And I would have the 
the picture on the table and I would pick these out as I needed them. And um, uh, the, um, the really important, uh, the really important innovation here was, uh, we can use that one, um, was uh, blue tack. Now, <laughs> blue tack may not seem to be tremendously important, but when you're trying to joint people, uh, cardboard people together, as I started off doing it with um, um, pieces of cotton and sellotape, and they, their joints seemed to woggle about, they had awful troubles like this. So I used to use chunks of reverse sellotape, and that used to stick on for a moment, then fall off. But a little ball of sellotape, when stuck on the other yeah, side of that thing, I have to pick a button, a little, little ball of blue tack would, um, would stay on and I could pull it off and put another one on and uh, it, made, it doubled my output. I was really, I was really smart the stuff. The other thing which happened then was that I invented something. I invented something really great which I was tremendously pleased with, which was that I would make all the soundtracks first. And having made the soundtracks first, I could, not, I could put them onto 16 millimeter film and I could put them through my machine and number them, so I could number each noise on the script. And uh, the result was that uh, I was able to uh, do something which the film trade had been doing for the last 47 years, but I didn't know about it. <laughs> like all, all of my inventions, they are actually do they arise out of ignorance of the fact that somebody else has already invented them already. <laughs> and, but I, I had to uh, start with making a recording and laying the sound and effects on to it by um, in, in, the, in the basement by doing my tape recorder and um, getting things to make noises with and making the necessary noises and I also had to employ uh, uh, do music sessions with Vernon Elliott who was um, a, uh, a bassoonist from the Philharmonia and uh, he would round up half a dozen excellent musicians and they would sit down and we would play a whole the whole sort of quarry of music for a particular film and I can still remember him standing there saying uh, this next piece is supposed to be two Vikings riding on a camel I'm not quite sure why but anyway this is what it is and um, we had to, I had to lay these down and um, that meant that Peter and I were able to sit down together and listen to a cassette recorder of the actual pieces of music which were and actual story we made a radio show complete with all the sound in it to work from and that was a great that was great use really useful to you to because yeah, you could see I the hear the characters read the script and hear the script and then visualize the characters and argue with you about what they looked like <laughs> well no you, you, you where they were going to go i was able to say well i want four feet of background for this going it's the same say that i were the engine he starts behind that mountain and he go across here in so many seconds and i'd say no he didn't he starts there and he goes that way because i'm left-handed he's right-handed and when we were doing um, the early stuff magnetic was in the mirror that didn't matter so much but when it was filmed we had to actually sort this out, so we usually made uh, made a decision in the end about which way. Well, you sat one side of the table, and I sat this this side of the table. So what I said is going that way. He took us going that way, but as far as he was concerned, it was going this way. It worked very well. <laughs> but the, the point about this was that although I was using the traditional method of uh, using having the soundtrack made first and having everything done, uh, we were still in uh, we were still coming to animation from the opposite direction from Disney, which is which we were not, we were providing animation in the minimal amount to punctuate the words. I had got the words uh, numbered, so I knew exactly what number frame a particular word would come on, and so I would make certain that the gesture necessary for the word happened at that moment. And this uh, was really very simple, whereas Walt Disney came to animation from the opposite direction. He came to it from life, and he was trying to reproduce a glorified version of life. And so, so his actual, he, he came downwards from perfection towards uh, uh, the, the to animation. We, ca we came up from a, a sort of glorified comic strip into animation. The only moral of this is that mine was a hundred times cheaper than his. <laughs> and uh, we had no complicated bar sheets, everything was worked out. And I was working off the cuff so that I could decide, it. I didn't have to have every single movement, every single, every single thing which was going to happen worked out beforehand and written on bar sheets. I was able to uh, 
sit in front of this with the, with the pieces of person there and reconstitute them and move them according to the uh, listening to the music and the, and the, the soundtrack as well and um, choose exactly what I was going to do and if I didn't want to do that I would do something slightly different and so I was able to uh, I was able to do, to, to do this. Let me show you a piece of working script which I had. Here's, this is one, other, this is one, a particular piece which is going on. Uh, it's out of a slightly later Noggin film and it's, he's saying, out of my way you scraggy pallet, I'll catch up in mincemeat. There's all the same <coughs> numbers and those over the other side on the left are the sword swipes. Shunk, shunk, the swords, and it's the meeting of Ronth and Graculus, and uh, the uh, just it's just a the, the, the red markings are my cuts where I uh, cut. It didn't mean I had to do any of the cuts in the camera. The ones with the ring round them overnight uh, meant that I had to shoot off 40 frames because in the next morning because the film in the camera would go would get sort of bent during the night, so I had to kill that kill that off. So I had to make a cut there, but the rest of it those cuts were all where they were going to come. And, and so it happened. So let's, let's see that next bit of film, shall we? Of the same thing, approximately. <laughs> no, it is the same thing. It doesn't start with the same, <coughs> the same thing. Oh, is that a rabbit? Graculus turned in the air and dived down to take a closer look. It was not a rabbit. <laughs> I'll get away, you scraggy parrot. I'll cut you up in my Here, I say, take it easy. Watch what you're doing with that carving knife. I'll turn away, you green-faced chicken. For goodness sake, stop waving that thing at me or I'll drop a rock on you. Now, put it down. Ah, uh, you're not a hawk. Come to eat me? Certainly not. I am Graculus, royal bird of the land of Nog. Guide and protector of Nogging, prince of the Nogs. And anyway, I don't eat people. Even little people like you. I'm not little. I'm the biggest and strongest in the hot water valley. The hot water valley? I've heard tell of some little people who live in a hidden valley somewhere in the far north. But nobody's ever seen one of them. Well, you're looking at one now. With the strong people. Tall as the summer grass. I will not have you call us little. My name is Rom. Greetings, little man, <laughs> and welcome to the land of Nog. Greetings, bird, and if you call me little again, I'll spike you with my broadsword. Oh, oh, and uh, I beg your pardon, I forgot. <laughs> but did you notice how little animation, uh, animation there was in it? how rare and thin, he was only there to punctuate the exact thing which happened. So that he said, I am, uh, and there was nothing happening, he was dead still when he's saying, I'm one of the tallest, I'm the tallest, as the tall as the summer grass. It was only when he had to move, and did you notice the way the sword blurred as it swung? Do you remember I mean, making that sword? One like that, one like that, and a blurred one in between. So basically, <laughs> all that was done with three pieces of cardboard. <laughs> just <laughs> swung it across in singly. But it, the, the, the thing about uh, doing those gestures, only those gestures which are necessary to tell the, carry the story, uh, it means that the viewer can take it in, in the right order for Matt, stacking in his mind without being distracted by other things that might be going on and um, he could then um, it, it, it seemed um, it, it seemed to work because um, uh, th there wasn't any extraneous things happening and it all had to happen because we hadn't enough money to be uh, too complicated the story had to be told incredibly straight and uh, it was the uh, same, it's the same crude, chaotic approach uh, for everything as uh, our friend Philip Moss of BBC Wales, who came to make a film about I Will the Engine, discovered when he had brought his film crew to watch us. Shall we see that film? Well? Look at that. I got some blue check here if you want to stick anything down. Well, uh, oh, it's the station in the snow. <laughs> These are the engines. 
but sometimes I colour them in. Sometimes I got my slaves to do it, my daughters to colour them in. There's Idris asleep. There's a little Welsh dragon called Idris. And there are various heads, bodies. There's a head. Looks to the, it's rather alarmed there. And uh, heads smiling. I have tins of these heads and bodies and legs sitting next to me while I was working it. Good morning, Mr. Day Station. Boulder. Oh. Oh. Good morning. Don't shake hands with him, Di. He's red hot. Let's see what Di is like. And how many bits I've got. Oh, there he is. Oh, yes. Marvellous. There's Di. He's saying regulation. I have nothing to do with regulations about that. Yes. <laughs> you know, George, that regulations. Regulations about the conveyance of livestock. So you just pull your head off. And you take the other head. And you tuck it in there. And there's a residual bit of blue tack on his collar inside. And you just press it down. And, oh, oh. There may be regulations. You can't do that, isn't it? Come on, Di, run. Run, is it? We don't know about that. <laughs> It would seem that this particularly sort of um, crude um, method of working would be useful for very clear situations and so on. But in, in practice, we found that you, we could, one could, with, even with the minimal animation we, we, were, we got, we could manage to um, convey quite subtle, uh, embarrassing situations, quite sort of... Uh, quite effectively anyway. I'd like to show you another piece of film about uh, Mrs. Griffiths of the Antiquarian Society who's come to try and track down Idris the Dragon who didn't want to be tracked down. Shall we see the next bit of film? I am looking for a display Edwin Jones. Uh, Mr. Edwin Jones? Oh, that's me. I, I, I am Edwin Jones. Ah, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. My name is Mrs. Griffith of the Antiquarian Society. I would like a word with you about this dragon. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Have you seen the dragon? Oh, uh, have I seen it? Have you seen it? Seen it? Yes, of course I have seen it. I found it on Smoke Hill and hatched it out of its egg. Red hot it was, but it sang like an angel. Isn't that right, Ivor? Ivor? Ivor. Which of you gentlemen is Ivor? <laughs> Neither of us, ma'am. The engine. <laughs> Ivor is your engine? Yes. He sings in the choir too. As well as the dragon. That's right. Treble and bass. Ivor is bass, of course. Your locomotive here, uh, he sings bass. Of course. Well, you wouldn't expect him to sing soprano, <laughs> would you? Look at the size of him. <laughs> You're a bass, aren't you, Ivor? Sing us a note or two. Oh, come on, Ivor, give us a blow. Lovely tone he's got. Oh, yes. Uh, Ivor, come on. Uh, Constable, uh, is Mr. George always like this? Like what, ma? Well, you know, <laughs> talking to railway engines and that. Oh, yes, he always talks to his engine. We don't take any notice of that. <laughs> Ivor, come on. You're making me angry. Come on, give us a note. Oh, don't worry him, Mr. Jones. Don't let's get excited. I'm sorry, Mrs. Griffiths. He's not usually like this. I think he misses Idris. You know, he just flew away. He was down at the fish and chip shops fine for us. What's that? That's right, 16 cotton chips. <laughs> yes, yes. And then suddenly, whip, whip, whip up he went and he was gone. Uh, I hasn't seen him since. How are you, Ivor? Well, <laughs> you know how it is with dragons, here today and gone tomorrow. Oh, yes, is it? Well, I dare say, but we miss him. We all miss him, Mr. Jones. We all miss him. You do? But, but you've never met him. Now, don't worry, Mr. Jones. Just get plenty of... But, but, Mrs. Griffith, how could you miss a dragon you never met? Oh. Why, 
quite interesting that that piece only took a day and a half to film, which is, as anybody in the trade will know, was an uh, incredibly short time. But of course, the reality, the core of the fun, one might say, was the marvellous voices, the voice of Alwyn Griffiths and Tony Jackson. Alwyn Griffiths is no longer with us, but uh, having that soundtrack to work with uh, told Peter and me exactly what the, what the pictures were to be, and that was what the real fun was. Tony Jackson was going to be here, but he's uh, got to be in a dustbin waiting for God over this evening. The, the actual recording was made weeks before, of course, and but the, Peter and me and the rest of the family, because I had already filmed to match the soundtrack, the, uh, and, and it all, he used to come with all his family when we got the fresh film back from the laboratories, I would join it together and lace it into that old projector of mine and that they would come in and we would switch it on and suddenly the whole thing would come to life. And that is a quite extraordinary sensation. The, the fact that you sat there moving these things in the abstract and then suddenly, boom, they're there. And they're also talking. And this was a tremendously exciting thing. Yes, a family. yes we, we, we look forward to that. When the girls came home from school and I would say, there's a bit to see, there's a bit of... Uh, uh, some of the uh, rushes have come back and we'd all go and sit on the old bus seat, wasn't it? An old bus seat there. Yes. Uh, and and uh, watch these little bits of film. Very exciting days. So that, that was the way we spent our time. It was, um, it was well, but it was not both our lives. That was where I spent my life pushing these things about. My problem, which I had uh, later on, was a shortage of Peter time. Peter was busy with musical box and illustrating books and pieces for the comic and I had to find a subject for some films to make which didn't involve him in cutting out uh, quantities of cardboard and uh, making backgrounds and everything else. And I did find one uh, by accident uh, hanging on a clothesline in Joan's garden. Uh, let, let, let me show you it. The next bit of film, please. There's a big barn look. There are usually penguins in the big barn, but of course it's no use charging in there looking for them because they will hide. No, we'll have to wait here and see if we can see one. Look, there's one. It's Penny, I think. Yes, that's her. She's looking for something. She's looking straight at us now. Keep very still and quiet. And perhaps she won't notice us. No, it's all right. She's got better things to worry about. She's off somewhere. I wonder where she's going. She stopped. I wonder what she's seen. <laughs> oh, look, it's Mr. Penguin. Papa, Papa, come down and run. I can't come. Can't you see I've just been washed and I'm not dry yet? Mama, come. Mama has laid an egg. What do you say? Mama has laid an egg. Oh, well. <laughs> Technically speaking, that was a very stupid thing to do, what I was doing. And did you notice the way the grass was waving about all the time, and the leaves were waving about, and how it kept going light and dark? Well, anybody who ever thinks of doing single-frame filming out of doors, <laughs> may, may I advise you please not do it at all, because uh, it's uh, the, the effect of the changes of movement. And there's a, behind each penguin, as it walked through the grass, you probably didn't notice it there, there is a wash behind them of crushed grass, and I couldn't think what it was, but of course it was actually made by me walking up to the penguin, moving it, and walking back to the camera and dressing it up, and walking up to the penguin and moving it. 
coming back again. And of course, I was walking, trampling the grass all the time. And you could see this sort of like a sl like a slow wave coming out from behind them. Apart from the sort of changes in light, because the sun maybe went behind a cloud or something, there was also the problem of insects. And uh, there, a little woolly caterpillar walked along a fence while Oliver was filming a penguin, and he didn't uh, notice this until the film came back. And this. Oh, it was like a woolly caterpillar behind the behind the penguins who were doing that, their sort of minimal animation. But the caterpillar had no trouble with minimal animation. <laughs> it was going, moving about and trying to find a way off this thing. And it was, of course, when it came in in uh, out in in the film when I got the the film back, it was doing a manic fandango. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't see it. You couldn't watch the film. I had to throw it away and do another. <laughs> Uh, a tour de force, as far as the, as far as the, <laughs> the main difficulty with the pigments, the two difficulties, was that I had to get down on my knees and up again 400 times a day, which I couldn't do twice a day, let, let, let alone 400 times. And also, uh, I also had to film down on, right on the ground. Shall we see the next picture? And, um, yeah, uh, that's the pigment dolly. Um, that's two pieces of plywood, some jelly cramps, and the camera swings down right onto the ground. And when I have finished with one shot, I pick it up and wheel it away. And it is a, you can spend 25,000 pounds on one of those if you want to have one made uh, by the film, by, by filmmakers. I mentioned this to Arman when you went to see Arman and told them how I made it. And they were very delighted with the whole, whole idea because they just bought one for some astronomical sum of money. And, um, that was that was just quite quite useful. Uh, we can lose that now. It's it's four of the pieces long ago. Um, I've anyway, got, I've still got one of the pieces of plywood. I never throw anything away. And there's one of those. I'm, I've been wondering for years what it was, and I've just realised. <laughs> <laughs> I liked I, li I like making puppet films because they were uh, they had um, the the penguins themselves had. Um, steel, uh, they had a, a pound weight in the bottom and a steel stalk and a ball joint on the top and a, and, and, and a little beak and, that, and, and they had their arms as well and um, I tucked, I sometimes tucked the feet in underneath which were cardboard and somebody said they looked like uh, nuns on skateboards but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, don't, I wanted to make more puppet films, I liked making puppet films but I wanted to make them on waist high. <laughs> I didn't want to make them on the ground. I went to, and I found in the field behind our house, in the wood, woodland behind the house where I lived, uh, a big Arthur Rackham tree with a hole in the root of it, you know, and the, the gnarled um, the gnarled roots. And I thought, well, that would be nice, but I'm damned if I'm getting down on hands and knees. Obviously, some tiny rural creatures lived in that. They were they would probably be, we thought of names, I thought of names, they're probably pogles. I didn't care for leprechauns and imps, but pogles seemed to me reasonable and respectable. And so I asked Peter if he would be kind enough to make me a uh, tree, a, the root of a tree, the bottom half of a tree, both inside it and outside it. Uh, of the it was about that high, uh, made in a sort of papier mache method, except that. The papier was corrugated cardboard and the inside was wooden pieces of wood nailed together. And it was a very strong thing made in two parts so it could be opened up. And inside there was a little staircase going up made of wood. And uh, this, uh, inside the big barn, you saw the big barn there when we made the penguins. That was then thatched. That was when we arrived down in the Kent was this thatched barn, which was a bit of a, a ruin. But we had it... When we got the commission to make Pogles, we actually had the big barn restored and we had a proper tiled roof put on it and had it all sort of made nice and airtight and watertight. So you also had to make the Pogles as well. Shall we, see, shall we see the Pogles? Oh, yeah. There they are, Mr. and Mrs. Pogles. Notice, that they're, notice their feet, Peter. They have um, their heads of papier mache. I made a plasticine model and modeled the heads with papier mache. But the feet. Um, because when a puppet moves, it might, I mean with the penguins they didn't do much except shuffle along, but these wanted to walk and when they move, of course they fall over, so we had to think of some way of making them stable. And one way was to make their feet very heavy, so their boots are hollow and the, lid, the little toe caps lift up and inside the one that's on the ground is a little piece of lead. A big piece of lead? Well, quite heavy 
and that holds that foot down so the pony can do this. And then when he puts this foot down, and Oliver takes the lead out of them. <laughs> so that's how they walk. I spent the whole day them. picking pieces of lead out of their feet. <laughs> those, those, those were the well, those were the poles, and um, the, 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 and uh, the the animation uh, that was marvelous because uh, we. Uh, we didn't have to work on the floor anymore. I didn't have to work on the floor. I built tabletops uh, in the barn, and uh, right. the woods, the woods were actually piles made of polystyrene. And um, the the same effect as I had with the films, which again is uh, uh, simply they never moved more than was necessary to show exactly. So uh, Mr. Pogel would say, "Well, wife, where's my breakfast?" And she says. Uh, Oh, Pogel, you talk too much, and that's 24 frames, 15 frames, 10 frames, and 20 frames like that, and it's got through it really fast. Let's see the next bit of film. Uh, this was made before uh, political correctness was invented, which was quite a long time ago, so it's uh, not... Uh, oh, Pogel! fairy story and so they got tangled with fairyland and goodness knows what and they had trouble with magic and that got a little bit hairy and so it was uh, uh, things really could get a little bit nasty occasionally. Let's see the next bit of film while it's still uh, later on in the story. I'm afraid I have no alternative but to break down the door.
you'll be happy to know that Keats turned the witch into a nothing <laughs> and uh, she was the, the BBC hated the witch and they didn't care for witches in the back garden witches in fairy land were one thing but not in the back garden so the witch had to be consigned to the Pogol's annuals and uh, she had to go into literature let's see the next picture of the witch being consigned in she She's not actually, she's, I don't know what she's doing there, but it's just a symbol of the fact that she's left the films and gone into literature. We did the series of, um, my microphone on? I don't know, have a shout. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we did a series of um, um, animals every year, for some years, and uh, um, uh, always there was a witch story. Mine gone. Um, yes, each each uh, year we did an annual with a witch story in the beginning, and the uh, and the story uh, involved you know the first characters from the s first stories, and the rest of the annual was a jolly thing with games and puzzles and other little stories. But at least she survived for quite a few years in the annual. She did, and now Loaf here has made CD-ROMs of them, and the Dragon's Friendly Society has made a set of CD-ROMs of the witch stories. And very frightening they are too, I don't know, but that's their only life for now, I'm afraid. And, um, uh, we, yes, indeed, uh, let, us, uh, let us see the next picture, yes, that's right. That's the one, yes, the Dragon's Friendly Society, the CD-ROM book. And uh, it tells the whole story of uh, the Pogol Witch, which has got uh, some quite extraordinary pieces of magic in it. Yep. It's worth mentioning that the first series of, of Pogles was only shown once by the BBC because the witch was in it and was too scary for the afternoon. And uh, what followed that was Pogles Wood, wasn't it? That's right. We, the BBC asked us to make some a little bit less, some rural, properly rural things of milking and honey beaming. Uh, 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 getting milk from the dairy and looking at beekeeping and various other things and uh, the magic plant got uh, we made a whole set of those and then they asked us for another set of uh, 13 and this second set the magic plant who lived in their garden was wanting to join in a bit more so the second lot are like that but uh, they were a, a, fam a family group the, the, the next picture, the family group of Pogles didn't include the witch, but they did include uh, Tog, who in the middle there, who is half a, well, he's a bit like a squirrel. He's got a, somewhere, the bow out of Vancus. He's a Tog, yes, that's right. And, and Pippin, who is actually the baby that was in the, which the witch was after, who was the son of the king of the fairies, but they didn't, uh, the king asked him to keep them, keep him for them. Uh, and um, he was, um, he just took part in the ordinary life of the Bogles, which was quite extraordinary in its fashion. We're actually down to our last quarter of an hour or so, so right. we're going to have to get a little move on. Okie dokie. I know, I know. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we then had to go on to uh, making more, more puppet films, and uh, we had to... Uh, the BBC came to us and wanted, uh, in 1969, a colourful, modern, up-to-date set of out-of-this-world epics. So Peter and I tried to remember whether we had, had anything to do with space. And we had... We found a book called... Um, Take this one away and show it. Noggin and the Moon Mouse. Let's show the next one. We, yeah, we did a book called Noggin and the Moon Mouse. This is the Moon Mouse. He is a little character that came down from space in a... A little capsule and landed in the new horse trough that the Nogs had built in the in the town square as part of the celebrations. And um, the point, the problem was what you do with a little visitor like that from outer space. And the children were a bit rough with him, so uh, Nuka had to tell them. Nuka was the queen, had to tell them that you had to treat um, visitors politely and entertain them and send them on their way. And so he refilled it with um, soap flakes and. Uh, 
vinegar and took off in a cloud of uh, stinking greasy bubbles which completely covered the town and disappeared. But anyway, we realized that that was going on out in space and we, we looked in our imagining in, in our imaginary sp in space and we realized that they lived somewhere on a blue planet of some sort and uh, we, we thought, th thought that they would be out there. Uh, we got another picture which what, what came from Matt Peter's mind. We had to sort of bring them up to date and uh, we got rid of his pigtail and his duffel coat and because of all the junk flying around in outer space we gave him armour. And uh, these were the first sketches I did. Um, Oliver and I discussed what they'd look like and what they'd do and where they'd live. We decided they'd live inside the planet and they'd have these sort of bolt holes out to the surface because it's a bit unfriendly out there. And uh, uh, we then um, decided that we'd, be, we'd have some of these funny old gadgets in. And We took them along to the, to the BBC. And, uh, and then uh, let's see the next bit of film, which is about the... These are Mikado on the arms with little bits in between. And um, it's stiff, you see, it stays where it's put. And that, if you imagine that stuffed inside a clanger, you could put his arms exactly where you want. That's, they're lovely to animate because they stay exactly where you put them. If you animate with wires, it tends to spring. But these actually stay dead still where you put them.